My name is Mitra Manesh. I'm a servant. I serve through teaching, coaching, consulting, or any other way that I can find to share what I know with those who want to know. And this Lights On podcast is one of those ways. It was created with consciousness and mindful living in heart. So join us as we travel through many roads of learning and transformation together. And if you enjoy our podcast, please give us feedback by rating us five star and share us with others if you think they may benefit from it. On behalf of my team, I thank you for your presence. This is a longer episode and it's part of an interview that Marion Cortina from Luan Museum had with me. We covered many, many topics from pandemic to nature of life and knowns and unknowns of life. But really the main theme was about how we use our power of choice and make decisions that serve us in life. I hope that it serves you and I hope that you enjoy listening to it. It's about half an hour, so I suggest that you um, take your warm or cold drink and take a listen. Hi, Mitra. How are you? It's wonderful to have you here in Luan Podcast. Hi, it's great to be back and looking forward to our conversation. Yes, I want to introduce this amazing woman that I have in front of me. Her name is Mitra Manesh. She's the founder of InnerMap. This is an innovative new mindfulness app and the host of Lights On. It's a podcast offering support for a mindful life. She is a mindfulness thought leader, storyteller, and educator with over 3.5 decades of experience, helping people of all ages and many different cultures to live, love and lead more consciously at home and at work. Her work is a blend of Western corporate training and Eastern based practices. The result is a unique approach offering knowledge and wisdom in a practical and empowering way. Her clients range from everyday people seeking peace at home and work to celebrities seeking balance and to institutional and other entities such as UCLA, Mindfulness Awareness Research Center, Amazon, Mary Lynch, Unilever, UCLA, Hugo Boss, Thomas Cook, the Senate of Canada, just to name a few. Beyond mindfulness and corporate work, she is a human rights commissioner in Ontario, Canada and an executive for numerous non-profit and for-profit entities around the world. And Mitra, I cannot you know, wait to ask, with all the knowledge that you have, with all the experience that you have, I would love to ask you why some people are suffering or suffering more in these times. What is happening around the world and what is happening with humans? Hmm. So what I see, and, and now, as I told you before our um, former conversation, that uh, it's an, uh, there's been amazing contact and connection with people around the world since the pandemic. Uh, what happened, what pandemic brought us was really the truth of the fact that the nothing is permanent. We had this illusion of the fact that some things are permanent and we have them forever. And we saw that the pandemic showed us that that's not true. Uh, organizations collapsed, families collapsed, normals collapsed. And those who were really believing that things need to stay the same or believe that they are the same all the time, those are the ones that are really suffering the most. It's the same pain. All the losses that I'm not by no means disrespecting or not honoring the losses we had because we've had many in a global sense. I personally had like a lot of losses, people that I knew personally and lost them to COVID. However, the question, a larger question is, do we really know what life is all about? And if we think life is a permanent thing, and then we'll be really disappointed with life. Mm. But if you really em embrace and understand that life is about change, life is always changing. Right now, you and I started a few minutes ago. Biologically, psychologically, spiritually, we both have changed. Mm. The bodies have changed. What our conversation will bring to us and hopefully to people that are listening, they change. So 
if we are in the midst of an energy of change in life, wanting to be like completely solid and not changing, then there will be a lot of suffering. That's a very philosophical general answer to your question, but I'm sure we'll go deeper. Did that go home for you? Yes, also, but the only thing constant that we have in our everyday life is change, right? It's something that we even have, you know, the change of the seasons, we have, you know, life and death, right? We, we have kind of like this physical and biological uh, rebirths constantly in our lives. But why is change so difficult for many people? Why many people have resistance to that change if it's something so natural and so unique to our existence? Mm. I do agree with you that that is what life is all about. Life is showing us that I'm about change, day and night, and like, you know, this and that. Um, I think people who have this um, element of control and do not live in the present moment, which you really, I'm talking as if like there are those people and these people, we all do that. But the question is to what degree? When you live in the past and future, which means that you want to either go and change the past or somehow uh, control the future, then you will be suffering. But when you live in the present moment, when you understand oh, the most important part of the conversation, that you do have a choice. You see, in this survival mode that many of us live in, in that state, we really believe we don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I when I counsel people or when I'm teaching my classes or when I'm speaking and people say, but, 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 but Mitra, you don't understand our condition and they want to really represent their pain. And I'm saying, I do hear you. I do honor your pain, but I'm also saying you do have a choice. There is a comma after our pain story. The comma is, I have a choice and I can handle it. I find a way. What's the way? I don't know right now because I'm in the midst of the pain, but I do trust that there is a way and I am capable of finding the way. So it's really about choice and choice happens in the present moment in short. Totally. And about taking, it's kind of like taking responsibility, right? For our choices, because sometimes we tend to think that just life happens to us, right? And sometimes it does, but it's how we react and what we do with that, you know, where we, where actually responsibility comes in. And when we understand how responsible we are for our happiness, how responsible we are for what's happening outside in our lives, eventually I think that's kind of like one of these aha moments that helps us start this kind of like personal work journey. Right. Instead of life happening, life is happening to me. It's like I am part of making what life is, you know, being made of. Yes, absolutely. And life is happening, of course. Like pandemic happened, mm -hmm. but but the question is, I, I always talk about this dance that we have. So there's a dance happening. You and I are dancing in this conversation, right? We're dancing with life. The question is, to what music are we dancing? So pandemic happened, same for everybody. Different conditions, same pain. The question was really right from the beginning up until now that hopefully we're at the end of it. The question was, what is my choice and what's the music that I'm choosing to dance with and dance to when it comes to the pandemic? Um, many people saw it as a doomsday and, and that was fine. Many people saw it as like, oh, this is a great thing. Many saw it as a, in a very balanced way. Of course, there's a element of pain to it mm -hmm. and we acknowledge that and honor that and grieve that and then there's also element of opportunity when mm -hmm. my old home is completely gone and demolished now i have a new choice to build a new home yeah. all the things that i was attached to well they're all gone and at now I can rebuild it. But am I rebuilding it with a sense of knowing and empowerment? Or am I building it thinking, oh, I just need to pick up the pieces and then somehow, you know, do something with it. Yeah. So what I'm emphasizing here is really the, the importance of choice mm -hmm. and knowing that how I manage myself and how I dance with what music I dance to the events of life 
mm-hmm. is what determines whether I stay in suffering or do I move into growth and change this um, mm-hmm. unusual times mm-hmm. into an opportunity for change, which I think you and I were chatting about it, which has been. Has it been difficult? Absolutely. Um, has it been amazingly full of opportunities? Absolutely. The question is, which one do you want to pay more attention to? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, which one do you want to bring it more to life, right? Exactly. And I, I completely agree with you. And I would like to focus on the in-between of those moments, because I think sometimes that's where the pain or the fear sometimes resides. So, for example, if, if you were talking, you know, metaphorically about your past house, right? And then you're having your new house or it could be your past self as an example. There's a moment, maybe you're here with your past self. You're not that past self anymore. You've decided to change. You're making that choice. You're being responsible, but you're not yet your new person. And this in between, when you are kind of like in no man's land, when you are kind of like, oh, you don't know who you are. You don't know uh, many things because you're in that transition that's a moment where a lot of pain happens. How can we transit those moments of pain between changes? Great question. So what's happening in in that between the old home and the new home, as you said it, uh, we are really thinking that once we arrive to the new home, we'll be fine and all will be as well. And when we promise ourselves that, then we can't wait to get there. What we need to remember is also these moments in between places are waiting. And I, I, I call it in the making moments, right? Because it's like, okay, let's go with the metaphoric uh, aspect uh, of, of the home. So home, the foundation is poured. Now they're building the rooms. Now they're putting the windows in. When we always chase a destination in life, and we do that because we've been trained that way, that brings a lot of suffering. If you look at our life journey, for instance, we were born and said, oh, if you go to school, I remember I was the youngest, I couldn't wait to go to school. I thought school was the it. And school was amazing. But then I thought, oh, graduate. I want to graduate from school. Then you wanted to go to college. They wanted to find your partner. They wanted to form family. And I'm thinking if we really go with that idea, then the ultimate thing is death. So we're chasing death. It's, it makes no sense for us to let go of these amazing moments. Nobody taught us that it's amazing when you're in high school. It's beautiful when you're in kindergarten. Well, the moments between like being on your own out of your family life and getting into your next family life. Well, those are amazing times. That's when you make memories, you get to know yourself, you go in and out of relationships and you really know what you want. Nobody put value on on that process. Mm -hmm. I always give the example of, I live in Los Angeles right now. So if you saw me at the airport and you say, Misha, where are you going? I say, well, I'm going to, you know, South America. And you say, so, oh, what, what's going to happen? I say, oh, I'm going to go and travel and find people. He said, then what happens? I say, well, then I come back home. You say, oh, so why are you going? You're going to come back home. And I think, That's true. Why am I spending two weeks of my time, all the money and and all the potential unknowns to? Because that's where the value and the meaning lives. So I never stop traveling because I'm going to always get back home. It's the same thing in life. I'm not going to ever do that because eventually I know what's going to happen. It is those in-between moments, those encounters, those unknowns that brings the excitement of of traveling. You told me you want to travel to Middle East or Africa. Okay, you're going there. If you knew exactly what would happen and it would be exactly like home, then why would you bother to go? Let's invite those unknowns, which is really about our relationship with knowns and unknowns, that we've been told that it's great to just control what's going to happen. And I'm thinking, no, if I can control it, I don't want it. Because then I plan for it. I'm not taking away the planning, of course, like the traveling example. I'm going to travel and and make sure I am safe and I have the hotel arrangement and I have converted my money and all of those things. But I also want the element of excitement and unknowns, letting go of my attachment and obsession 
with known and familiar and control and and things that I want it to be this way. It won't be exciting if I knew exactly what will happen. So really, the short answer, tune in to the opportunities in that between. It is there. It is in that pause. It is in that waiting room of life that all those interesting things happen when you're open to it. Of course. If not, it will be completely boring, right? And, we and uh, stressful. Yes. <laughs> and we discover many things about ourselves when we are, you know, in adventures, when you're in the unknown, right? It's kind of like sometimes, you know, you discover things about you that you didn't know there, they, there existed. And that's because, you know, you went into that adventure, you said yes to new things, you kind of like jumped into it because obviously, you know, jumping into the free fall, it's, it's, it's a fear of the unknown. It's about not knowing what is going to happen. And sometimes fear tends to paralyze us, right? Yes. Yes. What about those, how can we start to overcome or have a better dance with fear in our lives? Because yeah. the amount of projects of businesses, of relationships, and maybe would have been done if we humans didn't have that much fear. Start small, mm -hmm. very small, because usually we seem to jump in where it's too big to handle. And I say, Start very, very small. What is your fear? My fear is of unknown uh, or meeting new people. That's why there's so much social anxiety. It's the same thing. What if I meet uh, your friend and I don't know what to say? Well, I think of something. I'll, I'll stay in silence. It's okay. I ask a question instead. So start very small. Look at your fear and name your fear in a very general sense. So if my fear, I think, is meeting new people or experiencing new things, really my fear is about uh, control and not knowing. My fear is about unknown. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start little things, little unknown things, very, very small, very small. I'm going to go to a restaurant that I've never been to. I'm going to take a road and drive on it that I've never been on and see what happens and allow that sense of excitement reach you because we've never experienced it. We never know what it is. It's like if I've never eaten this food, it doesn't matter how you explain it yeah. and define it for me. I'm thinking, okay, I don't know what that means until I put it in my mouth and say, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I've never tasted that before. So introduce little small changes or whatever your fear might be. Say it's of, um, they say the most, um, feared activity uh, or lack thereof after death is public speaking. <laughs> and um, when I groom my clients to do public speaking, I tell them start speaking like in a meeting that you don't usually speak. They say, well, what that's got to do with public speaking? I said, well, start small. Start small because you know there's always people in, in like team meetings, one person never speaks. And I just say, unmute yourself and say something and say, I, I agree with you, or I disagree with you. I, I've experienced that. Start speaking very small, and then make your way up to standing there and speaking in public in front of many, many people. Or start um, practicing very small at home, just like as if you're speaking to, to an audience. So really understanding and identifying, naming your fear, and taking very small baby steps, kind, ooh, compassionate baby steps toward doing it. Because where we get lost is when we start becoming critical and mm -hmm. judgmental about ourselves. And people use very unkind words about themselves. Like, I'm stupid, I'm not able. And, and, and they talk about themselves as if they're a fridge and they can never be in an oven. Mm -hmm. I don't speak very well. I can't do this. I said, well, no. You haven't done it. I understand. But doesn't mean that, I mean, you weren't a parent before you weren't a parent. So mm -hmm. you can't say, well, I've never been a parent. You never did this amazing project before you did this project. So there's always a beginning mm -hmm. and there's always a comma that I can do it. Really believing that how you are unfolding as a beautiful being 
adding to your abilities and and desires and passions as you walk the streets of life. Mm -hmm. Totally. I remember this yoga instructor, um, his name is Jorge, and he used to tell us something that I found really wise. He said, like, most students come over here and they're like, I've been doing one year of yoga and I cannot touch my toes. You know, what's going on? You know, and like really frustrated. And he would turn around and tell them, like, it's like you you were just were born. You're one year old in yoga. You're just kind of like, you're still a baby. You're still, you know, kind of like learning to walk. So be patient with yourself. And even though, I don't know, he has been, you know, 40 years, you know, teaching yoga. And he was like, I've been 40 years. I'm still discovering what yoga is and what my life is. So if you start seeing like something that you started uh, metaphorically and compare it with, you know, the age of your life doing that thing, you would treat yourself more kind because you would be like, okay, yes, I'm, I'm a baby or I'm a toddler or I'm, or I'm a child. I may be five years old, even though I've been doing this for five years or, or anything else. Um, you're still a child and you're still kind of like navigating and understanding and trying to figure things out. And we tend to be like, oh my God, I've been five years on this and I can't believe that I'm not doing this, 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 this and that. And that inner critic and that judgment comes in and there's, I think, the biggest killer of dreams, the biggest killer of art, the biggest killer of creativity is your inner critic. It destroys everything that goes through it, right? I agree with you completely. And, and let's acknowledge Jorge for that beautiful, wise statement, because that's true. We are always, even if we weren't just one year into a practice, we're always rebirthing ourselves because every day we're renewed, every moment, every breath we're renewed and a new person is showing up. And knowing that we're work in progress. I mean, I've been practicing this for 40 years mm -hmm. and, and still there are moments that, oh, moments, many, many moments that I find myself, oh, oh, that's where I'm at. I just finished a... Uh, uh, teaching a course at UCLA on overthinking, how we overthink. And and somebody asked me after the class that, you know, so you don't overthink ever? I'm thinking, when did I say that? Uh, he said, well, I just assumed. I said, that's not true. It's not that you don't do it anymore. It's just you do it less often and you wake up from it because we're in a, you know, illusionary state. Wake up from it faster. That's all it is. We're never teaching not to fall because, I mean, if we're alive, we're going to fall. But we're also practicing that when I fall, I realize, oh, oh, I have a choice. Oh, I fell, you know, noticing and remembering our choice and then practicing how to get up. That's all we're doing. That's mm -hmm. all we're doing, no matter where we're practicing, whether it's music and art or, or mindfulness and yoga wherever it is, or being a parent, mm -hmm. or being a lover, or being a sibling. We are always in practice. You know, I, I see these uh, carts in the supermarkets that they have a little one. I don't know if you've seen it. It says in training for little kids, they're doing it. And I'm thinking, I need that sign for everything. I need to hang it on my neck. I'm in training. training. I've been in training all my life about different things. We are always in training. So we need to be compassionate about that, that they're just like we're learning so many things mm -hmm. so often mm -hmm. that only with compassion, only with presence, only with recognition of our choice, we can go further. Otherwise, we can just, just like stay in one point and just go at ourselves in a brutal way. And sometimes we do. Totally. It's kind of like having that student uh, mindset instead of the teacher mindset, right? The teacher is kind of like, okay, I already know it. I can teach everybody and there's nothing else that I could learn, no? as an example. And uh, the student is all the time kind of like thirsty for knowledge, thirsty for getting to know more. And what you were just saying, it reminds me a lot of the quote from Richard Branson, the one that he says about that, you know, all babies fall down when they're starting to walk. Right. You've never seen a baby that stops not wanting to walk because he has fallen down, he or she has fallen down. And most of the time with, with us, you know, in adulthood, sometimes we can have a failure. Sometimes we can have a setback. And then we're like, no, yeah, I fell one time. I'm not going to do that again. And it just kind of like we give so much importance to that. And you watch little kids, they fall 
constantly. And that's how we all learn to walk. We all of us fell down so many times when we were learning and we still had the courage to continue walking. And sometimes in life, it's just one fall and yeah, that's it. <laughs> yes, that's a beautiful example and story of babies, you know, trying to uh, walk because they don't have a point of reference for failure. Mm -hmm. We have made points of reference and that's why I said presence is important. Uh, I talk about past being only good for one thing and that is for learning. Mm -hmm. We go back to the past, of course, we don't want to delete it and we don't want to um, pretend it didn't happen, but we don't want to really focus on our failures. We want to go there, I call it with a visitor's visa, and, and not stay there. And we go there asking, what was my learning? What are the notes that I want to put on this? And what are the things that I really want to do? And I think this presence, this, this idea of being in present moment that allows us to understand that no matter where we are, even when we can't change things, including past, mm -hmm. we can benefit from it and we can show up in a different way is the idea that will eventually save us and take us to a different realm of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Because you can see, and well, I can see that people are now standing at the fork. Mm -hmm. We are really all collectively standing at the fork and we need to decide either go deeper into our suffering mm -hmm. or go deeper into our choice. And the choice is ours. Mm -hmm. And if you're choosing that, you can see that there's always you know, negative information. There's always exaggeration and dramatization of the news. And we can go that way, sure. Or we can go enough there to get what serves us and get out as soon as possible and come back to our choice land and to our present moment. Mm -hmm. Choice is ours. I mean, everything you say is true for you. Everything I say is true for me. The question is, what do I want to pay more attention to and put it in the frame of my, I call it living room and consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's that's what we do when we put a picture there. If I put the bad news there, I'm saying this is what I give importance to. Mm -hmm. If you put your choice there, you say this is what I want to give more attention to and do prominence and, and importance to. Mm -hmm. All our choice. It's always been that, right. that way, but it's more so now. Hope this episode answered the question or two for you or provoked and inspired questions in you. I'm so grateful you showed up and listened up. Until the next time, be well and stay curious. <laughs>